previously, I think my net worth was negative 283K when I was 30, <laughs> to give you an idea. Um, and young and dumb and stupid and stupid tax, like Dave Ramsey talks about. And, you know, literally one night flipping channel, saw him on Fox Business Network and just thought, I can do this. This might, this might be the answer for me and literally changed my life. You're listening to the Millionaire's Unveiled podcast, where you'll hear the stories and interviews of everyday millionaires. We'll unveil their decisions, their strategies, and their current portfolio allocation. Now to your hosts, Clark Sheffield and Jace Mattinson. Okay, welcome back to another episode of the Millionaire's Unveiled podcast. This is episode number 142. Jace, what's going on, man? Not a lot. How you doing? Good. Doing pretty well. We just had an interview with a guy from Australia here tonight. He's a real estate investor primarily, right? Or I, I guess all in, in Sydney, Australia. So that was pretty interesting. I think we've had a few Australians on the show. Yeah, we have. We're getting more. Our audience is growing. We just got an email this last week from a listener in the Philippines, actually, and uh, we had a couple more from Europe in the Baltic region that have been tuned into the show and a few more in Asia. So it's growing. Yeah. We need to get people from other countries, South America. I'm not, uh, we had a we had one from, I think South America, but yeah, we're always trying to, to find new guests and, and different backgrounds. So we had someone write in and said, Hey, can you find someone, you know, with this kind of background and we're working on it. We're, we're trying to find as many diverse backgrounds, countries, stories, whatever, as we can. I think then everybody can connect with somebody. So we're working on that. We had an interesting uh, interview last week. He, he had a net worth of 500. Alex, he's a real estate investor. He owns primarily single family homes, but has one multifamily investment property. He has about $100,000 in cash and a few ETFs, some, some things in stocks. And he mentions, uh, if you listen to the intro, he says he was a train wreck until he was about 31, until he finally got it together. So interesting episode there. That was that was 141. But you know, one thing we talked about just after this interview, Jace, was was having a wills and estate plans. And, and you, you always hear, hey, that's so important to set up. You know, I personally need to do better at that. I don't have something that's that's set in stone. What about you? And I, I know you recently had some conversations with people that were, I don't want to say older, but whatever, older, right? Farther along in life. And, and they said, hey, I haven't necessarily been the best at updating it. And, and these are all successful people, right? Yeah, totally. I think just this pandemic in general has brought the attention for a lot of people. Do you have some of these ancillary things in your financial life in order? I mean, a lot of us say, hey, like, yeah, buy a house. Yeah, get a credit card or a debit card or whatever to, to be able to spend and, and, and build some of that credit for yourself. But we often forget all these different insurances. We forget, you know, estate planning and a will. You know, if you died today, Clark, Clark and, and, and your wife, you have assets, right? So, it's important to get these things done. And this conversation we're having amongst these these individuals, you know, in this group that I'm part of, it was shocking to amongst all of us, just how many of us hadn't updated things during this pandemic or even in the last year or two. There's a, one guy that mentioned, you know, and he's, I think, in his late 50s now that he does it every single year. And this year, because of the pandemic, he spent a bunch more time restructuring some things, making sure everything, you know, was, was eyes dotted, T's crossed, everything with, with a different attorney than he normally uses uh, that's got a little bit more experience and stuff. And so it, it really made me realize and start to reevaluate some of the things that, that I probably need to do on my own. Uh, you know, every year I do reevaluate our insurances. I've got a couple of kids, so I've got a life policy. This last year ago, I put an umbrella policy in place as well. Yeah. How much do these people usually spend for for their wills? I mean, what what should people be looking for? Do you have any sense? I really don't. You, you know, a will is is actually been somewhat commoditized. I think there's a, co a fabric life insurance company, it's an online life insurance company. I think they have free wills. In fact, I think that's where I did one of my initial ones was through them. Actually, you basically just print it off, fill it out. They've got all the documents in there that you need. And uh, you just go get it uh, notarized, uh, have a couple witnesses and stuff. And I think that's it. So that one, you know, in terms of a will, that's, that's you know, there's free online tools out there. Fabric is right. one of them that I know of. I think there's a few others. You know, if, if you're going to go get a put, put together some estate documents, you're going to be spending a couple grand depending on how complicated things are. 
you know, you just never know what can happen and you don't want to have a bunch of loose ends. I think, I don't know what the statistics are in this country, but so many people die without wills. And I think you're going to probably see, and without life insurance for that matter, or, or even disability insurance. You know, that's another uh, insurance gap that's very common in this country is some long-term disability insurance. And I've personally had family members affected by that, friends, parents that have had, you know, issues with that. You know, if they were, for example, a dentist or something, and, and, you know, one developed a, an issue and, and he couldn't practice any longer, couldn't practice for a, a long period of time. They're just things to think about for your profession and, and your life. What might be per- pertain to you, for example, and, and reevaluate that every year. And, you know, I think it's super important. I, I've gained a new appreciation talking with a bunch of these uh, individuals that are, are much more experienced and wiser than I am in terms of the importance of putting these together and reviewing them and making sure that, you know, each year that they're done correctly. And and once you get it all done, I mean, you just think about this, you you get in all these investment accounts too, and you have all these passwords, you have emails, you have all these email passwords, like where's all this stuff stored? If you were to pass or not be able to, you know, be incoherent, you can't give access to that information or your spouse doesn't know. I mean, it was crazy when I sat down with my wife and we discussed it a little bit. She didn't, she didn't even know half my passwords. I'm like, whoa, shoot, I'm terrible at this. Like I really need to put together, you know, this individual that, that, that I talked with, he put together this big old binder. He's got one in a safe deposit box. He's got another one in a safe at his house. And then one of his friends has it, doesn't have all the passwords, but has all the stuff where he could find the information. And, you know, he, he prints it out and he puts it in there and he's got a hard copy it every year. He's got a, he's got a electronic copy. His attorney's got a copy. So there's a few copies floating around, but he does it every year, updates it. Right. I just laughing because you think of that kid, he's got, you know, let's just say he's got four kids, 25% each when he passes away. It's like, you don't want to tick off that guy. He's going to bump you down to 20% in the next year when he, <laughs> when he updates his, his will, you know? Yeah, yeah who yeah, knows? It's been, a, it's been a rough year for Janet. She's down to 20%. <laughs> it could be. I don't know. I don't think he's that kind of guy. I think it's just more of, you know. It's, it's responsible when you get to that uh, agree, you know, level of wealth. I mean, you go look at any type of multi-billionaire or multi, multi, multi-millionaire. You know, you and I both have had insights, you know, working in public accounting, some other things to some of these individuals. They all do it. They all have, you know, these estate plans. Why don't, why doesn't somebody that's worth a million or two million or five million have them, you know? Right. Agreed. And and you bring up disability, which is a good one. When we had Chris Hogan on, we just interviewed him last week or something, and we'll launch his, his guest interview in, in the future here. But that's one thing we asked him about is, hey, look, disability insurance is expensive, but it's obviously important, right? Totally. When do I get it and how much do I get? So yeah, it's interesting. Some of these other, other things you don't really think about until something happens and it forces you to think about it, right? Or you hear of somebody who is in a situation that's forced to think about it. So, I mean, I'm included here, right? I don't have it all together either. So just uh, interesting to think about and something to get done to put on the to-do list. So just uh, I wanted to read an uh, iTunes review we got this week. It says, I love this podcast because it showcases all sorts of people who are successful via multiple methods. Some guests may not match my personal approach to FI. However, I love listening to them all because I almost learned something I always learn something from each episode. Keep up the great work. So thanks for that interview. If you enjoy the show, if you get something out of it, please leave us a review. It helps us grow the show, reach new millionaires, and, and, and keep this thing going. So appreciative for that review. Today's show, we have an interesting interview with Dennis. Dennis works in the IT field. He works as a, a IT professional. He has a net worth of just north of a million, and he, he invests in, in three different buckets. The first is cash and cash equivalents. He keeps about three years of living expenses there. The second bucket is is three years of living exp- uh, expenses in a taxable account with a 60-40 allocation on equities. And then his final bucket, he calls it his, his retirement funds, which is mainly equities. He also has a, a paid-for house. So really interesting interview with Dennis. Great episode last week with Alex and a couple interesting episodes coming up here in the future, including a guest interview with Chris Hogan where he's generously donated three books and we'll be doing a giveaway with him. So thanks again for listening. Hope everybody is doing well. And without any further delay, let's get right into today's episode with Dennis. Dennis, you want to just give us a little about your background and kind of what you're up to now? Sure, absolutely. Thanks for having me, guys. Excited to be here. Um, I'm in corporate IT sales at at this point. So I've been doing that about um, almost six years now. And then uh, previous to that was in the IT staffing space for a total of about 13 years or so. Um, so current net worth, um, 
million at this point. You know, the vast majority of how it's divided, I actually use a three bucket strategy is what I use um, from the retirement manifesto blog. Except I put that into practice in my allocation phase at this point. Bucket one is cash, cash, cash equivalents, um, three years worth of, of living expenses, if you will. Um, I'm in sales. Sales is great. You can have some really good years, but you can have some not so good years. And so lifestyle creep um, is an area in which I've definitely experienced in my past. And so um, having that solid foundation there, like what we're seeing now in the market, when the market's down almost 20% in the last month, having that cash and cash equivalents, I think, is really, really important. Um, the second bucket is essentially three years worth of living equivalent as well um, in a 60-40 allocation. Um, so 60% equity, 40% bonds. The 60% equity, VTSAX, of course, about 25%. Um, I'm in a mid-market, uh, mid-cap Vanguard fund, Admiral fund at about 18%, and then a small cap Vanguard fund at about 18%, and then everything else is in a intermediate tax exempt bond fund because that's a um, it's a taxable account, and then everything else I have bucket three is nothing but 401k Roth IRA super hyper aggressive intentionally almost 100% equities, and then my paid off house of course, um, and a couple of vehicles that brings that total to that 1.06. So you've got no debt then? Zero debt. I'm a uh, Dave Ramsey success story. Okay. So Probably I, never I wanna, heard of them. Yeah, I want to get into that a little bit. And you just kind of threw out there. So 1.06, did the last two weeks change your mind about how you invest at all? I don't like seeing the numbers, to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> and, but, and just for our listeners, we're recording this on March 9th. So we've had a, a little bit of a bloodbath. I think the S&P is down about 19% right now. But anyway, keep going, Dennis. You're 40. Yeah, absolutely. So you're you're kind of on the younger side too. But I'm just curious for our listeners if, if, if anything changes your mind. Yeah. So uh, that's one of the reasons why. So the three bucket strategy is actually popularized by the Retirement Manifesto blog. And so essentially, um, it's run by a gentleman named Fritz and, um, his whole focus is to prepare for retirement in the next five years. He believes you need to fill these three buckets up. So three years worth of expenses in bucket one, bucket two, another three years worth of expenses in, in bond funds, things of that nature. And then the last one can be more aggressive on the equity side. And, and that approach just really kind of spoke to me for reasons like today. You know, where we're down almost 20% over the last month or even a couple of weeks. And it has been a bloodbath that, you know, I can tell you right now, if I was sitting there with a 90 10 allocation, 90% equity, 10% bonds, I would have probably sold it last week. <laughs> right. Because timing the market is one of the worst things that you can do because the issue is you got to be right twice. You, you have to obviously get out at the right time. But I think getting in can be even more challenging because I think that. You know, we're hitting plenty of turb turbulence in the stock market at this point. But um, I think a lot of this stuff, I'm hoping, you know, blows over in the next few months to where it's just kind of an afterthought. And if anything, a buying opportunity. So if anything, having knowing that I stick to a monthly budget, knowing that I know what that monthly monthly budget number is and can divide it out for three years. And then my bucket, two was back tested against 2008. It came back point to point within two years and eight months gives me an opportunity to, you know, sleep peaceful at night knowing that yes, I am giving up some yield in certain um, certain markets, but at the same time, I, I would it's all about downside risk in my opinion, because that's the piece that people forget to talk about quite a bit. Yeah, totally. So you've got the paid for house too, which kind of provides some of that that downside risk in a way, right? Because you've got no liabilities. Yep. Big piggy bank is what that is. Yeah. And 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 to be honest with you with the with the house where we are now, we bought this a few years ago at about 278. Now it's worth about 350. So you get to ride that inflation wave with it to where, you know, some people have said, investment people I know and, and are friends with, I'm crazy to be doing that. It needs to go on the market and so on and so forth. Yes. Last year, you know, 25 plus percent, 28 um, percent S&P 500. That's a great year to do that. But what about years like this when, you know, you're down considerably at this point. And so 
it's it's more about peace of mind. You know, I agonized over it a little bit. Um, I, I'm one of those people I really believe in Dave Ramsey and kind of where I was and where I am now within literally a decade, um, having 1.06 million worth of assets to, you know, previously, I think my net worth was negative 283K when I was 30, <laughs> to give you an idea of um, how how illiterate I was when it came to um, understanding finances. Um, always been a pretty good earner, you know, in, in the corporate IT side of things. Um, but, you know, never really gave as much thought as I should have until I was sitting there, you know, feeling like that, you know, looking at having to bring home 120K and an affordable place to live here. Um, it was just almost borderline reckless, right? Um, and young and dumb and stupid and stupid tax, like Dave Ramsey talks about. And, you know, literally one night flipping channel saw him on Fox Business Network and just thought, I can do this. This might this might be the answer for me and literally change my life. Yeah. So that's kind of crazy, right? Like in less than a decade, you've kind of built from from zero or below zero to where you are now. When did you pay off the house in that whole journey? So when I paid off the house specifically, I made a couple of real estate moves that helped a lot. Um, I paid off my house in 2018. So that's still somewhat recent. I bought a house in 07. At the height of the market, not a good time. Was able to get out of that house roughly, for the most part, even. Maybe lost maybe ten grand, but I was able to buy a house um, here in town that I that was in a really good neighborhood that I knew of. The guy was asking two forty five. I was able to get the house for two hundred two, and um, put thirty five into it, and then turn around and sold it for three twenty six, and then rolled that into the house I'm in now. So. Um, that was about an 80 K 80 K swing that really, really helped me, you know, pay off the house. And I got, I had a pretty good sized deal at work that came in and I just thought to myself, I just need to go ahead and pay the house off now and get rid of this. And the market's going well. And, you know, there's a lot of opportunities in the future, but, you know, just knowing that I know no longer have to make that $2,000 mortgage payment every month. And it's closer to about $450 a month when it comes to taxes and insurance. That was just too good of a deal not to pass up. So, Dennis, going back to that house that you bought and then put 35 into and then sold, was that always the plan? Was was that the plan initially or did you think you were going to buy the house and then stay in it? So I bought the house because it had good bones and it was in a good neighborhood. It was not necessarily a forever home. And I knew that going in. Um, but living in my hometown where, where I grew up, you know, I, in my opinion, I have a little different perspective than you know, just somebody that's sheerly looking at the numbers and that's it. And and we were able to kind of buy on, on an upswing. Um, we bought it December of 2012. And then, like I said, put about 35K into it. And then a few short years later, I mean, we've all seen real estate go gangbusters lately. Right. So the house you're in now, you bought it 278, you said, right? It's worth 350. How much yep. did, you, did you put 20% down or more than 20%? Well, <laughs> actually, we... Um, we put 20% down when we moved in here, but we sold our old house after we bought this one, um, okay. just because we found this and it was a good deal. It was for sale by owner. Um, I got a really good real estate attorney that him and I partner here and there with, um, some personal residences that I've bought over the years and, you know, just got a good deal and put 20% down and then sold the other one. It was funny. Um, he gave me the escrow check for, I think it was $225,000 and, I literally let that escrow check sit around for six or seven weeks <laughs> and then I finally <laughs> cashed it and he called me on a Tuesday morning and he said, what the hell are you doing? And I was like, oh, I just got around to putting that check in the bank. And he he was in disbelief with the whole thing. And I was like, OK, sorry, if there's a next time, I'll do that. But, um, <laughs> you know, it was one of those things where I was I was kind of sitting on that money because that was kind of my bucket number one. But I came to the realization and, and granted, I had a really good year in 2018 that I had to turn around and be smart with my money and, and go ahead and wipe the slate clean um, because not every year is going to be as good as that year. Yeah, I want to get it. I want to get into that in just a set in just a second here. Um, and then how long did it take you to pay off your house? I know you paid it off quickly. So the way I see it is I've been trying to pay this thing off since 2012 when I bought that other house. Um, I would throw, uh, I would do the Dan Ramsey steps, right? Baby steps. Already have an emergency fund. I had already paid off all my debts. Um, already funding 15% to retirement, like he talks about. 
married but have no kids and so um was able to you know have some excess cash flow from from what i needed um with my monthly budget and you know some months i would throw four or five or six or seven thousand dollars at the um at the mortgage depending on if i got a bonus or something um or if i landed a big deal and got some good commission dollars and so um it's really kind of I'm not going to sit here and say I paid it off in 2018 and that was it, but it took me about probably six years to pay it off uh, wow. when you think about it like that between 2012 to to now. But granted, I was cash flowing some things along the way as well, like that 35K, that house in 2012 that mm-hmm. came out of my pocket. Mm-hmm. Pretty amazing. And, and I, I just want to ask you, because oftentimes the house is a hot topic about whether to pay it off or not. Right. And obviously, right. Dave Ramsey encourages that you do. I mean, do you ever think about that? Do you ever say, look, I mean, right now, especially right now, recording this at the beginning of March, right? You could go get an interest rate, an all-time low almost. I mean, hard to go back into debt when you're not in debt now, but did that cause you pause a little bit to pay it off quickly or was it just peace of mind or what was that for you? So one of my good friends that actually listen, I I tell people about this journey and most people just kind of roll their eyes or some people say, I want to do it. And the first thing I do is say, here's a Dave Ramsey book, read it cover to cover. If you read it, I'll talk to you about it. One of my good friends that actually did that, and he's dug dug his way out of some pretty sizable debt. He was texting me today and said he just got a 30-year. He's moving back home up to Pennsylvania and got it for, I think he said, like 2.87 or something on a 30-year. Wow. Um, which is crazy. Now he's, he's, he's ex military. So he gets VA loan and stuff like that. But he sends me that and I'm sitting there going, okay, I'm sitting off, uh, I'm sitting here with a paid off house, but God, it's just <laughs> cheap money, right? But yeah. then I pull up my, pull up my cell phone and look at the stock market or turn it on first thing this morning. And, you know, it's paused for 15 minutes from trading because, you know, it's down 7%. And so, uh, it's just one of those things that I'm more comfortable on the roller coaster. If the roller coaster is paid off to a certain degree, right? Sure, sure, sure. Um, no, that's the it's just personal are. preference. But yeah, yeah. you know, I look at last year. I think you know my my um, rate of return across across my investable assets was you know twenty six point three eight percent. And I look at that and go, wow, what if I had an extra two hundred and fifty grand in the market? That'd be great. But you'd be given most of that back already. So it's really more personal preference. But in my opinion. You know, my follow up question to that is always, well, what do you plan to do with the money? Um, because I think that's really, really important. I think just sticking it in the market, you know, not accounting for downside risk is a potential issue, right? Because everybody's intelligent when the market's going up. Not everybody is when it's going down. Um, or you're looking to, you know, sink it into to some rentals, which in certain aspects, that might make some sense to a certain degree. But I personally think that you need a place to live. Everybody needs a place to live. You don't have to worry about your home not being vacant. And the way I see it is, you know, that's that's essentially where you're making your money there to a certain degree. Right. You got to pay somewhere to live, right? Totally, totally. So, Dennis, I want to back up here to the beginning. You know, you you have a paid for house, right? It's worth three fifty. You're young. You're over a million dollar net worth. You say you live on a monthly budget. But it, it wasn't always that way for you, right? And I don't mean that to sound disparaging at all, but I, I just I just know that you, what your story and kind of what you mentioned to us here before we started recording can really resonate and help a lot of people. So as much as, as you're comfortable, maybe share that part of your story and, and kind of you, you said you, it was it led to one night sitting on the couch and Dave Ramsey coming on and that's when you wanted to change everything. And, and now you've obviously done a, a an amazing job of turning it all around. So as much as you're comfortable, maybe share that other side or the beginning of this story. Sure. Absolutely. So when I turned 26, I finally started making some money, um, by money, you know, making 90, hundred grand or more from 26 on. Um, when I was 27, you know, bought a house, bought multiple cars, you know, literally financed my mattress, had a Home Depot card that, that stayed at limit at about 2500 you know, literally just telling myself, I deserve this. And kind of like I was telling you guys before um, before the call, um, I wish I could sit here and say I'm one of these people that has, has, has been saving since I was 12 years old. Um, I'm probably the total opposite. Like to go out, have fun, you know, when, when you have some money, like it's good to spend it some. Um, But I probably took that to extremes growing up to the point to where I looked up and, you know, I'm 30 years old and I've got a 97 percent loan to value on on 
my uh, on my hundred and eighty four thousand dollar home, I owe one hundred and seventy eight thousand, and then um, I'm approximately one hundred and five thousand dollars in debt on top of that, um, two vehicles and and multiple credit cards. So um, to where literally I was in the hole, you know, almost two hundred and eighty five k at thirty years old. And what really stood out for me was at the time I was in the IT staffing industry. And uh, we did salary plus commission and the commission can be really good in that industry. Um, you work your tail off, of course, but my base salary was like 50 K. And I remember reading through um, some of our benefit information, which probably most people that worked in IT staffing straight out of school didn't read it. But I noticed that from a long term benefit standpoint, you only get 60 percent of your salary. So I'm sitting there thinking, what if something happens to me? You know, it's good that I have some benefit coming in, but I know for a fact with the amount of things I have financed, there's no way I can live off of 30 grand. I've got to do something. Um, and I just didn't really know what to do, um, to be honest, as, as dumb as that sounds to a certain degree or, you know, just financially, financially illiterate to a certain degree. My folks, they make pretty good money. Um, you know, you hang out with them. They've, they've got um, enough money to throw around and, and everything else. But, you know, at the same time, they're just like everybody else. So point is, it was learned behavior to a certain degree. And so I just got to the point where I was just disgusted with it. Um, I knew I didn't want to live like that anymore. And luckily one night Dave Ramsey comes on the TV, start listening to him on the radio. He was, he was on the TV, I think through 2011, 2012 or so, but went out and got his book, read it in two days, made a lot of sense, put a plan in place. Now I did tweak it a little bit here or there. Um, he probably wouldn't agree with, you know, a hundred percent of it. Cause I know he's, he's very adamant on his baby steps and things of that nature, but I made a few small tweaks that made me comfortable, more comfortable with it. Um, so essentially I was more likely to do it. Right. But um, it was absolutely a life changer because here I am sitting at 40, you know, at, at 1.06 million. And I did that in a decade with a decent sized shovel, admittedly, um, making, you know, somewhere around um, approximately 140 to 200 um, during that decade, which I know is a little bit more than some people. But I'm also not sitting here saying I own some you know, multi global business where I'm making $5 million a year that's, you know, just too hard for the average show like myself to, to understand. Well, and you also had a, a, a lot of debt to pay off too, right? Yep, absolutely. So, so maybe maybe a bigger shovel, but a lot of that initially at least went to pay down some of those debts, so you weren't able to invest it and save it right away. Yeah, and I will say out of that 105k, the makeup of the debt, the the two vehicles were probably about 70k, and so that right there, I sold both of them and got rid of them. And uh, I mean, I remember buying a 2008 LTZ Tahoe with all all the bells and whistles and everything else, just got a good size bonus check from work back in uh, 2008 when the market wasn't going great and was ready to get a good deal. And I bought it off the show floor for 51K and they gave it to me for 46. And I thought that was a good deal. Um, drove it for two years and turned around and got 30K for it. And so nothing like mm. taking a nice little $16,000 hit on depreciation in two years, right? Yeah. Um, but I do think that that helped me get out of that hole quicker, actually having assets that I could sell. I turned around and bought a Nissan Maxima for about 20K, paid cash for it. Um, and then, you know, the rest of the 105K was essentially consumer, either credit card debt or debt on appliances or whatever it may be. So just worked so, my way through it, snowball method. So the cars, Dennis, were you married at the time or those just both for you? So I was at the time. Okay. So, I mean, you mentioned snowball method. So whatever routes we could go here, one being, how did you find the determination to kind of keep going, right? When at times I would have assumed that it probably felt like it was going to be a long journey and kind of a slow process, yeah. right? And then two, uh, how did you kind of turn away from keeping up with the Joneses in a sense? Because obviously all of us, we buy nice things, we like nice things, right? Oftentimes it makes us feel good when we have nice things or if we go on vacation, we stay at a nice hotel. And once you kind of experience that, right, the lifestyle creep starts to happen and it's a little bit harder to trim that back. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think part of it is you just got to be sick and tired of being sick and tired as, as cliche as that sounds, you know, of money coming in, money going out, you know, just looking at it, sitting there having to make 120 grand a year take home after tax to break even in an affordable part of the country. It was just, you know, looking at that and knowing that about a hundred thousand dollars of um, the money I was making pre-tax, of course, was commission based and knowing that 
you know, a client could say, we no longer need these people anymore and literally cut them. Um, so it was, I guess I had it scared into me enough after actually pulling back the onion, the layers of the onion and really thinking through what would happen if now granted a lot of that was during, you know, it was 2010 and just, you know, 08 and 09 had just happened. I actually had pretty good years those years, but my business looked like it was going to start slowing down because I had a major client that was picking up and leaving town and outsourcing their business and some other things happened to where, you know, it just kind of, just kind of scares you to a certain degree, scares you straight, if you will, to say, I don't want to be one of these people that, you know, just, just live hand to mouth all day, every day and or be house poor. And, you know, I think a lot of the, I think the biggest risk within the professional community when it comes to um, being financially secure is overextension quite a bit. Right. And I think we've all seen examples of that where, you know, somebody's been with the same company 20, 30 years, they're making, you know, 200 grand, 300 grand, they're living like they're making four or five and they lose their job for whatever reason. And they are just overextended. So I just didn't want to, I didn't want to be one of those people. And I was just kind of sick and tired of being sick and tired of, you know, I mean, it got to the point where I would feel like I literally couldn't breathe sometimes, right? Thinking about all this stuff. And I was like, I just don't want to live like this. And luckily stumbled upon Dave Ramsey. Yeah, you know, one of the one of my favorite Dave Ramsey episodes that, that I've heard was a few years ago and a lady called in and had significant amounts of debt and was trying to kind of you know, she was trying to make payments on it and get it out and and you know, process it all and, and she told the story I believe about one time she was in a grocery store line and she had rung up a bunch of groceries and she had her couple kids with her and she gave her her debit card because her credit cards were all maxed out and they tried to run the debit card and it wouldn't go through and and she was like that's it. Right. I, at that point I had had enough and I said, I'm yep. done. I'm done. Yep. And I still remember her saying like, I'm done. I'm, I'm never even going to finance a pencil. I don't want to do it anymore. And, and that's like Dave Ramsey then went off about like, you've got to, you've got to find your moment here. I've had a moment, that moment yep. where you say like, yep. I can't take it anymore. I'm moving on. Like I'm, I'm changing my life and, and it all starts new from here. Yeah. And I will tell you the, the other half of your question, how to you know, sustain and, and keep the momentum going, you know, listening to his show, I would listen to it two or three times a week. If I wasn't watching it on TV, um, I still listen to it now sometimes. Like even now with my 1.06 billion net worth, I get the itch to go do something stupid. And, you know, I listen to his show and it kind of, you know, puts me back in line <laughs> to a certain degree. It, yeah. it's, it's crazy as that sounds even now, but I will tell you, if you hit rock bottom and or, you know, just absolutely get sick and tired of, of that feeling, you know, it's one of those scenarios that I actually kind of experienced this. It was funny. So my wife and I, we, we got her a 2015 forerunner um, a few years back and put half down and then said, I'll just finance the rest of it. Right. Going back to old ways. It was literally $292 a month and I was totally out of debt and everything else with the exception of that new car we just bought. And, um, it got to the point where I was just like waking up in the middle of the night with horror dreams of being in debt again to literally, I paid that whole thing off, uh, after six months. And I was just like, no more. I'm not going back to that because that feeling that I had before really kind of came back. And, um, when I was in, in super debt and I just don't want to live that way. Plus, you know, it gives you options, gives you flexibility, you know, with, with your career, gives you flexibility to, you know, with, in the market when things are happening, right? Um, with with my three bucket strategy that I've put together, I, I feel pretty secure. Put me back on here if the market drops another 20, 30%. I may say something a little different to a certain degree, but I'm just dollar cost averaging into it. So, so Dennis, sure. you've got this great story. You've built a net worth of a million bucks and some change in less than 10 years. You dug out of this hole. You've got your lifestyle in check, paid for a house. Where do you kind of go from here? Keep stacking them, right? Keep stacking the money. It's one of those things that I've got my bucket one, that's my three years. I've got my bucket two, that's my three years. And now I get to be aggressive with my investments in, 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 in bucket three. And so the goal is, is just stack up as, as, as much, uh, as many investments as possible. Number one, number two, like I was telling Clark, um, waiting for some of the real estate prices to come down and maybe get into some single family and get some get some cash flow going on on that side of the fence as well. 
Um, because really where I want to be is I want to be at 50. So another decade from now, um, to where, you know, either one, I don't have to work or two, I can go do something that that's fun to do. Right. Not saying what I'm doing now is not fun, but, um, just more of go, you know, go work part time as a realtor or something because I can. And so just continue to build the net worth. And I think that it was kind of interesting that when I paid the house off, I wasn't like jumping up and down super excited because it really wasn't it was impacting my bottom line, but not a ton for the first few months. And I just spent, you know, eight years on this journey of digging myself out of just a ridiculous hole here that was all self-inflicted, right? Now what? Where's where's the target now? And so um, I actually use personal capital um, these days to kind of track my net worth. And that's helped me a lot to, you know, sit here and, and, and be disciplined when it comes to monthly budgeting, knowing what that household number is while allowing some of that number to, you know, have fun and be able to go out and knowing what that consists of, but still be disciplined um, because it's so easy to just lose focus with, you know, everybody throwing advertisements at you and everybody, you know, trying to get you to buy new cars and everything else. You just got to, you just got to stay, stay focused about it. Do you have a target net worth or, or passive income goal that you're trying to hit? So from a passive income goal, I would love to love to get to the point to where somewhere around 120K ish. Um, I think that would you know, be really comfortable for myself and my wife. Yeah, you know, from a net worth standpoint, um, that just becomes what it is, right? So what's that? Three million, I think, is probably what it is. And that might be somewhat lofty, but we'll see. I mean, with no debt and you know, having the house paid off and you know, being smart and with with in discipline, you know, with our money, I think I think we might have an opportunity to make it there. You're Maybe gonna cru- you're gonna crush that, man. Yeah, I'm very conservative when it comes to that. <laughs> but I mean, right. net worth three, right? If you're 40 at one, I mean, this market's gonna turn around. You guys are making good good money, low expenses. You keep maxing out your Ross 401ks, whatever. You know, you're gonna you're gonna crush that. Yeah, that's my biggest my biggest piece of all this is trying to shovel more money in the market. Yeah. Net worth of over a million, obviously, it's taken some grind, right, to get there and, and perspective and some an I've had it moment, right, if you call. That's kind of what we mentioned. Yeah. What, what, what else has helped you get there? You know, for some people, it might be work ethic, right? Obviously, you were able to get a high income early in your career, right? $100,000 age 26 is is amazing. Was it luck? Was it finding good investment opportunities? Was it being scared of being in debt, right? That's one thing you mentioned. Are there a couple of things that you can say, look, those are the two things. That's why I'm a millionaire. So one is I just kind of happened to be pretty good in sales. It's kind of funny. You know, I graduated with like a 2.67 GPA, I think it was in college. <laughs> um, went, went, went to college to hang out and have fun. Ended up with a real estate finance degree, now doing IT corporate sales. Um, but it just kind of, it kind of came to me to a certain degree um, from a sales acumen. I like, I like to talk to people. I enjoy, you know, supporting my clients and, and solving problems and all that good stuff. Um, and, and as we all know, doctor, lawyer, engineer, salesperson, if you're good at it, you're going to do pretty well in life, it seems like. And the work ethic goes into that, right? Nothing, nothing comes for free. That's for sure. And you got to work your tail off and, you know, sometimes it can be a very difficult business. I think the other piece is I kind of realized from the financial advisors that I went to in 09 and, you know, in 2013, 2014, that um, I need to get more educated myself. Um, and so um, I'm a big book on tape, audible person these days. And there's a handful of books that really help me, um, you know, kind of kind of run through and, and get educated with this stuff to the point to where um, I don't even work with an advisor anymore. Not because I don't like them. It's just because, you know, from a, from a market return standpoint, I'm a big index fund guy at this point um, and just try to get more and more educated. And, and so taking that financial education seriously was uh, was really important. Yeah, good answer. And, and along the financial education piece, are there any books or tools or I know you said you budget. So any budgeting tools that you recommend that have, have helped you get to where you are? Yeah. So when you're digging out of debt, um, I highly recommend uh, Dave Ramsey's Every Dollar uh, account. I know it's a little tedious to a certain degree and you have to drag everything over and whatnot, but it's really by design to force you to pay attention 
to what you're spending and hook in your credit card or hook in your debit card into it and, you know, track your funds and, you know, get a good feel of, you know, doing that for five or six months. And then you'll understand kind of where you need to be from a, you know, household budget number to a certain degree. Um, that was really helpful early on. But at this stage where I am with, you know, with no debt, personal capital has a good net worth calculator I use, um, dashboard I use on a regular basis, just kind of track things. Um, I know there's some other ones out there, but that's, that, that's what I prefer, you know, from a book standpoint, of course, Simple Path to Wealth, right? J.L. Collins, read that. Um, you know, I think that it, it provides a really, really good perspective. Um, I really like 99 Min- Mil- 99 Minute Millionaire by Scott Allen Turner. That was a really good one to just kind of explain the different different investment options of going to a broker or robo advisors and what they are and how it's different and index funds and you know that that was a really good book and then the five mistakes every investor makes and how to avoid them by Peter Malak that was a excellent book and I was actually thinking I may pull that pull that back out and and take a listen on the audible to that given to where the market is right now <laughs> just to kind of you know sit back and listen to it a little yeah. bit and for a little assurance and whatnot but um those were really good and then tony robbins had a good book a few years back called money master the game where he does what tony robbins does and goes out and interviews people right i thought that was a really interesting book because um he interviewed the head of jp morgan he interviewed um jack bogle and you know, all of these pioneers and, and just knowing that, you know, I think it's something like 96% of all money managers cannot beat the market consistently um, year over year over year and how they package up morning star funds and how the unsuccessful just kind of go away and stuff like that. It's just really eye opening on, you know, how, how that business works and, you know, to get to this level and then try to get to 3 million, 5 million, whatever that number is by the time retirement comes, you know, you have to be educated when it, when it comes to understanding how the business works. If not, they'll eat you alive. Yeah. How many hours a week do you spend on, on this stuff, Dennis? Do you, do you read about it? Do you look at your, your budget? Do you analyze your investments? Do you think about new investments or is it more of a passive thing for you? It's really more of a passive thing for me at this point. Um, part of the reason is I do stay pretty busy um, in, in my corporate IT sales job. But, um, I would say I probably, I I keep abreast of, you know, world events and what's happening and, you know, checking, checking the market, you know, almost every day and reading up on news. And I'll probably spend a couple hours a day on that specifically each week. I, I probably spend somewhere around, you know, maybe two or three hours on the weekends, listening to, listen to, to you guys, listen, some Dave Ramsey and, to you know, some of these books on tape I mentioned and or exploring new books just because, you know, I like to learn and um, it's something that you can get excited about when you're at this point, right? Um, it might be a little harder to get excited about it if, if you hadn't gotten started yet. Um, but all of that stuff is, has been real helpful. But that's being more passive due to my, my corporate IT sales demands is one of the main reasons why I'm not in um, single family real estate at this point. Gotcha. Plus, I was way in debt back in 08 and 09 when, when the heyday happened, right? Sure. So just to end here with some rapid fire questions and then and then uh, advice, what's the most expensive car you've ever purchased? I think you mentioned this one earlier. $46,000. Okay. Brand new Tahoe LTZ. Uh, most expensive meal out that you've paid for personally? It was when we took, uh, my wife and I took our her mom and, and my parents out to dinner over Christmas, $550. For for how many people was that? It would be five. Four, five people. Okay. Um, what item or experiences are worth spending more money on to you, and what's not worth spending money on? I think travel is big. Um, historically, growing up, my my family was in small business, didn't get a lot of chances to travel, so I, I was kind of raised as thinking I need stuff. Um, but this, you know, this Dave Ramsey journey has really kind of you know, helped open my eyes to help me understand that I don't need all this stuff. I need some stuff, but I would much rather travel. Yeah. It's amazing, Jason and Dennis too, obviously amazing how many people that we ask this question to, I mean, it's getting monotonous, right? We ask it so many times and that's the main answer is travel, like experiences, right? That's what's worth it. And then what's not worth it is, is all over, right? Like stuff, expensive weddings we heard recently, you know, that that's like a more broad range of answers, but 
what's worth the money. Everybody is saying travel and experiences. No, no yeah, one's absolutely. upgrading houses. No one's getting, I guess we've got a couple that have gotten like a lake cabin or something, but a lot of them it's, it's just travel and experiences, not necessarily upgrading the house or remodeling or whatever. At least they haven't told us that. Right? Yeah, for sure. Okay. Have you ever, you, I know you mentioned this a little bit, you've used a financial advisor. A couple of them. Yeah. A couple of them. But not um, anymore. The first one had me in a variable life insurance policy savings vehicle. Longer story, but I'm, the company I worked for at the time, I was an HCE, so I could only put seven grand a year into 401k. And then I was making over the Roth limits at that point. Um, therefore, my only other option to a certain degree was to invest with him. And I found out after the fact, after I got uh, got educated, that I was being feed by about four and a half percent annually. Um, I was mm. putting five hundred dollars a month in from 2010, and I'm looking at it in 2000. I think it was 16, um, 2017, and it's not making any money. Why is that? Oh, because I'm paying all the fees. So, um, canceled that. Got a term policy. Went to another friend of mine that had a, had a local brokerage firm here. Um, he put me in a fully managed fund. Um, I made just enough. I uh, had just enough to invest with him to put me in the fully managed fund. Um, that was 2014, 2015, when, when the market was pretty turbulent. They overcorrected, basically, and bet wrong to where I was losing 8% with them, and I was losing 2% on my self-managed 401k. And so then and there, I kind of decided I can do this better than they can at this point. Wow, so. Interesting. Thanks for sharing. Uh, how much do you spend a year, household spending? Probably right around 75 k Okay. And, and if, if you're comfortable sharing range of household income through your working life? Yeah. So anywhere between, like we mentioned, 100, but you know, on average, it's 150, 200 with, with swings, depending on, on the year. Sure, sure. Um, and then what does it mean for you to be happy or fulfilled? You know, obviously, we're all working towards that. What does that mean for you? For me, it, it would get me to where I'd love to be at 50. To where I could go be a realtor part time and just work because because I want to and go play golf the other days. So um, that that's the goal at this point. Awesome. Well, hey Dennis, thank thanks for sharing your story. I know you, you you've shared so much of the personal stuff, so I appreciate you opening up. Any last advice or mistakes that you, that you've made that you'd like to share? Yeah. So just get educated when it comes to financial literacy. You know, some of the books I mentioned and. You know, there's there's some other really good books out there, but just get educated and make sure you know and understand this stuff because, you know, it's really up to you. Uh, and, and I'm a big believer when Dave Ramsey talks about building, changing your family tree, building a legacy. Right. That's essentially, you know, what, what I'm trying to do here. And so um, anybody that is wants better for you know, their family, be it kids or nieces or nephews or whoever, um, that's what it's really about. And it's the hard work every day that goes into that. Awesome. Awesome, Dennis. Thanks so much. Uh, great work. Thanks for sharing your story again. I think it's really going to resonate with a lot of people uh, in, in, in how you were able to turn it around so quickly. And, and now you're on a path for so much more success. So thanks for making the time tonight. Really appreciate it, everyone. That's Dennis net worth of 1.06 million. Thanks for coming on the show. All right. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks for listening to the Millionaire's Unveiled podcast with Clark Sheffield and Chase Mantinson. For more stories, investment opportunities, and information, check out our website at millionairesunveiled.com. See you next time when you'll hear from another everyday millionaire.